person tells me the story about how Michael, Mrs. Gay's first child, once told an eight-year-old Marvin that he thought the family shouldn't put up with Mr. Gay's violent ways. There's going to be repercussions for that one. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to a like, share the Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Today's looky looky will be our camellia flower. I think we got a few of the white left, the black left, and I think we got three gray camellia flowers left. Anyway, go on over there and check it out. And if you are not already a part of this book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes you, can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, woo. Ooh, y'all been wanting this thing right here. This thing like the hot potato, baby. Let's talk about Divided Soul. The life of Marvin Gaye. This going to be a good one. Certain he could never win father's approval, Gaye sought his attention through antagonism. For the rest of his life, Marvin would express his need for affection through provocations of violence. The perverse pattern of behavior, which would literally kill him. So we know that uh, Marvin Gaye's father shot and killed him. Okay, we know this. Now we know that the dynamic between them must have gotten so intense that that caused Marvin's father to shoot him. Remember, Marvin Gaye's father is coming from a place where Back in Lexington, Kentucky, when he was young, them damn gays killed each other. It makes sense how everything unfolds when it comes down to Marvin Gaye and his father. All the children were very scared of him, Mrs. Gaye told me. I tried to protect them as best as I could, but I was very frightened myself. Man, if I'm scared of somebody, I'm gonna poison them. My husband was a fearful man. I was afraid he'd beat me. When I tried to take the switch out of his hand, he'd push me away. Baby, your number one, your number one. Actually, no, because the Bible says your number one priority is your husband, not your children. Okay, so the husband comes first, supposedly, and then the children. Okay, man, I'm protecting my baby. That's why I don't fool with you Christians sometimes. Sometimes you Christians get on my nerves, okay? I, I love y'all, but sometimes you Christians get on my nerves. Did she ever think of leaving him? Yes, Mother Gay answered, but I didn't because I felt a loyalty and responsibility. I also felt sorry for him. Did you feel sorry for your children? I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to be practical. I'm just trying to think practically, okay, because People will put their husband first. Did she ever think of leaving him? Yes, Mother Gay answered. But I didn't because I felt loyalty and responsibility. I also felt sorry for him. I knew he needed help, so I stuck with him. Did you stick with your children? Did you stick with your children? Okay, shout to Lisa. Now I realize that he could have done without our children back then. He wasn't ready for children. He didn't understand how to treat them. If you want to stay with the nigga, teach him. I'll stay with you because you definitely need me more than I need you, nigga. If you want me to stay around, then leave my goddamn kids alone. But remember, this is the same woman 
that gave her child to Miss Pearlie because Marvin Gaye Sr. was like, I'm not fitting to raise no child that ain't mine. Send that Michael child, whoever, uh, Mildred, Michael, you know, Curtis, whoever. Send them to go live with your sister, uh, uh, Pearlie, because we ain't going to deal with that. Mrs. Carson tells me the story about how Michael, Mrs. Gaye's first child, once told an eight-year-old Marvin that he thought the family shouldn't put up with Mr. Gaye's violent ways. There's going to be repercussions for that one. Marvin told his father, God. Marvin told his father what Michael had said. Father's response was to ban the boy from his home. Soon afterward, Michael was sent to Detroit to live with Aunt Zoila. Jean Gay remembered it differently. Michael always wanted to live with us, but he'd been led to believe that Aunt Pearl was his mother. Mother wanted to tell him the truth, but father didn't. Michael finally discovered the truth when he became a teenager and father responded by sending him to Detroit where he lived with Aunt Zoila, another sister of mother. Living with father was something like living with a king. Marvin observed a very peculiar changeable, cruel, and all-powerful king. You were supposed to tiptoe around his moods. <laughs> uh, yeah. You were supposed to do anything to win his favor. I never did. Even though winning his love was the ultimate goal of my childhood, I defied him. I hated his attitude. I thought I could win his love through singing, so I sang my heart out. But the better I became, the greater his demands. I could never please him. And if it wasn't for mother who was always there to console me and praise my singing, I think I would have been one of those child suicide cases you read about in a paper. The word normal could never describe my childhood, Marvin claimed. First of all, I knew we didn't live in a normal neighborhood. I was brought up in the slums. The part of town we called Simple City. Ooh, Simple City! Let me tell you something. We lived on the south side briefly, okay, briefly. You know I'm from uptown, but uh, my stepfather and my mother uh, were separated. We only lived on the south side briefly for like less than a year, right? And it just so happened where we lived, it was called George Washington Carver Apartments, right? George Washington Carver, ooh, that was the worst place we have ever lived, child. Oh, my God, it was rat infested, okay? So me and my sister are going to private school, okay, together, living in a rat infested place, right? Didn't matter. You're a D.C. kid. I mean, it is what it is. D.C. is overridden with rats, right? So while we're there, down the street, in some brown brick apartments was Simple City, okay? Low income housing. I mean, it was a whole lot going on down there, but they were human beings too. It seemed half city, half country. I never lived in a high rise or a tenement like you see in Harlem. It was definitely a funky. Some people had outhouses, but there were also trees and grass. Still, I knew we were living on the bottom, you got it. Because my father was a preacher, I felt even less normal. And the kind of preacher he was, keeping the Sabbath on Saturday and ignoring Christmas while everyone else was exchanging gifts, well, that separated us from the rest of the blacks, even the other Pentecostal black families. The average person in Washington, D.C., even the average Christian, Father Gay told me, did not accept our kind. We received no respect and were considered the backwash of society. I, 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 I don't know if I agree with that, but okay. We were constantly branded, Bishop Rawlins reiterated, and looked upon as peculiar. But because we consider ourselves special people, it was part of the burden we accepted. Father Gay's relationship with the church had undergone several changes. In the late 40s, the House of God split. A faction of its membership, including Mr. Gay, followed Henry Ferguson and his newly formed House of the Living God. The division, said Bishop Rollins, was caused by a disagreement over the name. 
We couldn't accept a change in the original name. Though Mr. Gay went with the new group, there really wasn't any congregation for him to lead in Washington. He was a lay person with a title. In 1949, when High was named Bishop of the House of God, he rejoined us. And in the early 50s, he headed our Board of Apostles. Mr. Gay spoke to me of a church he had on East Capitol and 17th Street in Northeast Washington, D.C. But Mrs. Carson and Jean Gay claimed that when Father was still preaching, he did so only at home or in small storefronts rented for single Saturday afternoons. By the mid-50s, Bishop Rawlings remembered Mr. Gay had grown disenchanted with the church and went into seclusion. He never did much after that. My husband and Bishop Rawlings were extremely close friends when they were young men, Mrs. Gay mentioned, but they were also competitors. Remember? Remember when she said earlier that uh, both Rawlings and her husband were vying for her attention? They were vying for her attention to get married. Nowadays, the ninjas is doing it just to hunt. Bishop Solomon also remembered a time after a convention when both he and Mr. Gay came back to Washington to find themselves vying for the same tiny congregation. By the time I was a teenager, all during the 50s, Marvin said, father's relationship with the church had faded. That seemed to make him even angrier and more secretive. That's when he lost his healing powers. Reverend Gay had been our teacher, Bishop Solomon started, and it saddened me to see him leave the church. Feelings of sexual inadequacies permeated the life of Marvin Gay Jr. Complicating matters even more was his father's sexual ambivalence. Both men saw sex as a dangerous force that threatened and finally destroyed the peace of mind and the virtuous life they aspired to lead. Dewey Hughes, now an entertainment business executive, went to Randall Junior High School with Marvin and lived in the same neighborhood. He knew him well between the ages of 12 and 14. Randall is the same junior high school that my mother graduated from and all my aunts and uncles graduated from Randall Junior High down there in Southwest. Quick lesson in DC history. Um, when everybody came up from the South, most blacks landed either in Southeast or Southwest, okay? Because historically the South side was made for the underprivileged or black. I hate to say it, but it's true. Eventually, we moved uptown, but when my grandparents on my maternal side landed in D.C., they landed in Southwest, okay? So did Marvin Gaye and his family. So besides uptown, Southwest is like home for me also. Like many of us, Marvin was a boy in pain. He was in the scene that was something you could never kid him about. And he was also very shy, very afraid of girls. He wore his sensitivity on his sleeve. I don't think there's any doubt that he was ashamed of his father. We'd never be invited inside of Marvin's home, no matter what. It was evident to us that Mr. Gay was a flamboyant and extremely effeminate man. In the ghetto, the cats were the cruelest, putting you in the dozens those games of verbal abuse triggered bloody fights, but Marvin wasn't a fighter. Rather than express his anger, he absorbed it. A strong sexual ambiguity surrounding Mr. Gay was something I'd noticed the first time I met him in 1979. Though at the time Marvin was 40 and his reluctance to have me knock on his father's bedroom door, I sensed the same shame Dewey Hughes mentioned in describing Marvin at 12. In each of our interviews, Mr. Gay wore at least one unusual article of clothing, a lacy blouse-like shirt or a pair of flower socks. His speech and body language were soft and overtly feminine. Mr. Gay said Dewey Hughes, that's his friend, 
the one who was like, yeah, I could tell that Marvy Pooh didn't want me to meet or see his pappy, so I waited outside, okay? It didn't matter, because, you know, back then, your parents was anything, okay? Oh, you trying to hide me? Okay, let me go out front and talk to the nigga. Marvy Pooh's daddy didn't like Dewey, because he felt like uh, Dewey needed too much attention, okay? And we around here fighting for attention. So we don't need your attention seeking ass round here. My father, Marvin, told me in Europe in 1982 during a discussion of sexual healing, likes to wear women's clothes. As you well know, that doesn't mean he's homosexual. In fact, my father was always known as a ladies man. He simply likes to dress up. What he does in private, I really don't know, nor do I care to know. Yeah. Okay, yeah, his dad was putting sponge rollers in his head. All of our uncles did. I don't have no problems with that, okay? But yes, they was getting their hair pressed and curled, you know, and then they would roll their hair up, you know, because they wanted the curly hair. We know this because Bird of White did it. All the mills did it. Okay. I know you see your grandpappy sitting around there with a flower shirt on and a green polyester suit with some high heel platform boots on, so that doesn't bother me. Okay, we had that time. I never thought that time would come back, but it has. The Migos been dressing like the Isley Brothers since they came out, okay? And we know the Isley Brothers, them some effeminate dressing ass men. Like dressing like old rich drug dealer Italian. There have been yeah. other periods when his hair was very long and curled under. Like Ike Turner? Like Ike Turner, you mad, at, you mad at your pappy for wearing a mushroom? I mean, the stars was wearing that stuff. Maybe in his mind he a celebrity. Oh yeah, he is thinking he a celebrity. Cause remember, he's dealing with uh, self-centeredness just like Marvy Pooh is, okay? So I don't have a problem with him, you know, wearing all that stuff. I really don't, I, I don't think it's a concern. There have been other periods when his hair was very long and curled under. And when he seemed quite adamant in showing the world the girlish side of himself, that may have been to further embarrass me. I find this situation all the more difficult because to tell you the truth, I have the same fascinations with women clothes. In my case, that has nothing to do with any attraction for men. Sexually, men don't interest me, but seeing myself as a woman is something that intrigues me. Like Caitlyn Jenner? Is that what you're saying to me, Marvy Poo? You want to be like the Caitlyn Jenner? But Caitlyn Jenner, what? Does Caitlyn Jenner even have a boyfriend? Remember when Caitlyn Jenner came out? Caitlyn Jenner was like, oh yes, I'm a woman now, but I'm a lesbian. Confusion about manhood would become another great theme in Marvin Gaye's life. His search for strong male role models led him into boxing rings and on two football fields while he fought to prove, fought to deny, fought to win his self-respect. Talent attempts which proved futile. He was also convinced that he had inherited what he considered his father's streak of laziness. Bingo. Remember when we read Jan Gay's book, how basically the only person that could get him to get out of bed and do something was Anna Gordy. Was it Anna Gordy Gay? The sister of Bird Gordy? He, he definitely owed people albums and his ass didn't want to do it. I do it, I do it, I get to it and no show the hell out of them studio people. Gay Sr.'s chronic unemployment was another reason Marvin was so frustrated and angry with his father. I worked for the post office, Mr. Gay told me, as well as the Air Force in Western Union, but a back injury laid me off early and I left Western Union because I absolutely refused to work on Saturdays. I mean, it's the Sabbath. Bishop Rawlins' memory was that Mr. Gay worked very little and according to Beatrice Carson, it was Mrs. Gay who supported the family. I'd wake up four or five in the morning to go to work. Mrs. Gay remembered while my children and husband stayed in bed. I didn't have any choice. I had to bring in the food and I did. I'm proud of myself. I kept my family alive. Well, well you know your husband over there beating Marvy Poo to death. You do know that, right? And your other children too, okay. I remember Mr. Gay telling me of a job he had held for a very short time, said Bishop Solomon. 
He said he worked as a chauffeur for the government. I never will forget the reason he gave me for leaving. He told me he had tender feet. Yeah, he can't be pressing them pedals for the government. He can't do that tender feet. A chauffeur for the government. Did Mrs. Gay spoil Marvie Pooh? Mrs. Carson asked herself. I know we all tried our best to protect him from his father. He needed a lot of affection. That boy did. And I don't see how his mother could have done anything else but smother him with love. Besides, Marvin was the kind of boy you couldn't help but love. Mother was a devout church member, Jean Gay said. She believed those teachings of the house of God which insisted that a woman be submissive to her husband. Her religious convictions obligated her to obey father no matter what. See what I say earlier? See what I said earlier? People use the Bible for their own malicious ways, man. I'm telling you, man. Mother was caught in between, Marvin explained. She was too afraid of father to openly defy him. He might strike her. He might put her out. But as time went on, she quickly saw that I was going to be able to do something for her that father couldn't give her money. In Simple City, the gays might have been perceived as strange, but we were looked up to. We lived by principles, mother especially. Her kindness and generosity were legendary. She took in people and fed neighbors, even when we were still dirt poor. The woman suffered so, and yet her suffering seemed to make her stronger. The older I've gotten, the more I've wished that all women could be like mother. As an adolescent, Marvin was stimulated by the overriding powers of sex and singing. Singing. done so please remember to like share to facebook subscribe and visit uptopbeauty.com now remember this the same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down my naysayers my patron loves you babies have a good one dc i love you i'll be home in may baby